Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Town of North Beach Town Hall. Our guest speaker today is Mick Blackstone, who has written more and published more than 10 books. Uh, we're going to have quite uh, an interesting talk this afternoon. He's going to talk about watermen, agriculture, politics, uh, a little bit of everything. Come on in. Come on in. Hello. We ask that you sit up front if you like because our speaker is going to talk without the benefit of a microphone today. Okay. Glad okay. you came. Thank you very much. Okay. So my name is Grace Mary Brady and I'm the founder and president of the Bayside History Museum which sponsors this lecture today along with our wonderful partners, Where's Joni? our Twin Beach Library. Oh, we sponsor all of our lectures with our library. We just have a wonderful relationship. Hi, Joni. Hi, Joni. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, please turn off your cell phones. This is recorded, so don't whisper anything that you wouldn't want recorded, okay? <laughs> because people will come by the museum and ask to hear uh, the various talks. If they're out of town that day or it's a topic that they have a special interest in, we make these talks available to people that call ahead of time and they want to listen to them. And if you need to use the restroom or drink of water, there's restrooms right here on the second floor and there's also restrooms on the first floor. Without further ado, our guest speaker today, Mick Blackison. First thing that I want to do is thank Gracie and Joni, head librarian, head founder of museums. I want to make sure that you all join the Bay Side History Museum and support it. Many of you, or maybe all of you already did. Uh, but it's a great, great museum. And uh, it's just great that people do things like this. First thing I want to do is talk to you a little bit about, and by the time I'm finished, I hope you have questions, but um, is the state of the bay. Uh, so many people read about it, think about it. Some people would do something to improve the bay. Uh, right now, according to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, we're at a C minus. C minus in water quality or environmental? Water quality. From water, okay. I've been working with the bay, with the water, and with the marine industry for 40 years. I was there for the Blackfish Moratorium in the 80s, the development of the critical area plan, the Chesapeake Bay program, all those thresholds that we created to help the bay. Now we're at a C minus. We've been at a D or worse for the last decade. And it reminded me when I drove over here, uh, from over near Fairhaven, the development that has taken place from Harrington Harbor to Mexico, North Beach. It reminds me of the development that's taken place on Tillman Island. Now I'll tell you a story, they, people on Tillman never had any concept of sewer. I'm sure the old people here never had a concept of sewer. But when they put sewer on Tillman Island and talked to the watermen that lived there to get their support, they told them how great it's going to be because with sewer, the bay is going to be so much healthier. What they didn't tell them was the fact that they could then go from two acre lots one-fifth of an acre lot, i.e., from Harrington to Mexico. Now, when the people of Tillman realized this, and there were farms back then on Tillman, when they realized this, they said, well, wait, we, we don't want to have development like that. And a developer came and said, well, 
I bought the farm. Huge farm. He pressured the woman who owned it. And she finally broke down and gave it and sold. He said, now you have two choices. One choice is that I build X number of huge houses. The other choice is I build 10 times that in small houses here. But because we have sewer, we will build it. And there's nothing you can do. Then it got, because of the housing uh, industry that built up there, it got so that Waterman's kids couldn't afford to buy a house on the island. So my friend C.R. Wilson, who was 11 when I first wrote about him, he and his wife bought their house, Cape Cod, on five acres outside of the island. His brother bought his house outside of the island. He can't afford to live on that. And that's how it goes. I'm not against development. Uh, you know, everybody from Stuart Cheney to Joni's brother, close friends of mine. But I'm talking about in the last five or six years with sewage, sewer, and the fact that we've lost 14,000 plus acres of forest in Maryland. There isn't much we're doing to help with that. Now, you can get involved with your politicians, with the state and local, uh, and, and, and try to get involved, try to push. But I'm going to talk to you in a minute about some politics. Now, at a C minus, let me tell you that we're getting some grasses back, which is really important. The fisheries are doing well. Uh, we've lost some oysters this season, especially on the Patuxent and some places in Lake Shore to MSX and Dermo. Those are the parasites that destroyed our bay oysters two or three decades ago. We're developing a disease resistant oyster. That's through <coughs> generations of generations of generations of wild oysters that are learning to fight off MSX and dirty. Uh, Viola, a couple of years ago, instituted an executive order to, by 2025, we have to reduce total daily loads by 2025, from two or three years. So what I said to myself, that's great that we have the president back in the world. To do something to reduce total maximum daily loads of nutrients, phosphate, by 2025. That'll be about 50 years from when I first started writing and working. So all we do is we keep extending out. This is how great we're going to do this. Um, well, wait, what are we doing now? I'll give you another funny analogy or bit of information that I thought about. When we started working on this, we were 30. And I was working for the Marine Trades of Maryland. Will Baker, Bill Goldsboro, all these guys who work at the Bay Foundation, they're all 30. And Swanson, Bay Program, things were a little younger. Now we're all starting to retire. So we have gone through careers to get to a C minus. And I wrote children's books because I didn't have any faith in adults in taking action to clean up the bay. And I wrote adult books to try to educate all the people about the watermen and the plight they're in, or the success that they have, or their, or their importance as a subculture of our society. Because that's what they are, they're a subculture. 
from our society. They live on and go by tradition. You know that if you have your family, where you live here and you live near them. And to me, it reminds me of 30 or so years ago when we were losing all the oysters to MSX Derma, and Dr. Rita Caldwell at the University of Maryland, one of the world's leading oyster scientists, was holding a hearing on what to do about the Bay's oysters. And it was filled with the scientists we see today. And she said, stop the hearing. Stop the hearing. We're not going to talk about it anymore until we talk to all the water. They're the only ones that really know about the oysters. They're the only ones that know really where they're dying, how many are dying. We've got to talk to them. Now, we do have elected officials over these decades that are very close to the watermen and work for the watermen. But we have very strong environmental groups, CBF, CCA, so on. Seven River Association, I don't know so that. Once they saw that money there for the bay, they each created their own empires. And the watermen became very outnumbered. There are 5,500 licensed watermen in the whole state. Most of them today are LLCs. Limited LCs, limited crab catchers, LCCs, limited crab catchers. They have other jobs. They have to. And one of the things that is worrisome about these 5,500 is that the old watermen, um, the average age now is about 60 to 65. And the youngsters are not coming into the industry the way they used to because they can't make the money to get in. They can't even afford a license. It's fifteen thousand dollars to buy a title fish license. Now, what the state has done, interestingly enough, if I jump around, you're going to have to sort it out because I'm trying to keep it consistent. But you sort it out. <coughs> so, fifteen thousand for. Title fish license. I could sell an LCC for 4,500. That's just trot line. And you can add 50 pots, but 50 pots aren't really worth it for that. So, what the state did, they threw a little curveball and said, if you, we will buy the license back from you. If you want to retire or your back's out and you can't work anymore, and then we'll, we'll buy the license from you. And at the time, they gave market price for LCC, they gave market price for the TFL. Well, what happened was, it was kind of like the sewer on Tillman, with a sewer here. What they did was, their still curveball was, that, but if we buy it back, we will never see the light of day again. So what we had to do was rush out with information the watermen that if you're going to sell your TFL or your LCC because you don't want to do it anymore, you can't do it anymore, you sell it to somebody who wants to buy it. So we cut the government purchasing power out so that that license would stay alive for a young guy who wants to get in and do it. Um, so, so that's kind of how that all has worked out over the years. Uh, you all know about the rockfish moratorium back in 85. That was a five-year moratorium on catching rockfish, and that worked very well. And despite the fact that groups tried to put a total moratorium on catching rockfish, like they did in New Jersey years ago, which means that no one in New Jersey can eat straight bass or rockfish, uh, that was a highly dramatic hearing in the legislative office building. And it was really very cool because they had a bill to keep the moratorium going. 
And Larry Sims, the only president the MWA ever had, 40 years. He passed away two or three years ago, and now we have a new one, but Larry did it. And he's an icon. And then we had Bruce Barriotta, who some of you may have heard of, the highest paid lobbyist in the state of Maryland. And he was Mandel's lawyer, and all the way back, that's how powerful Barriotta was. So with this hearing on striped bass coming up, to extend the moratorium, you couldn't have got a mouse in that hearing room because it was so packed with commercial watermen, and environmental groups and the public because they wanted to see David and Goliath go at it in front of this joint legislative session. Anyway, at the end of the day, Larry prevailed. There was no moratorium. It ended. And it was a the five-year moratorium was a success. And there was no need to have it be on, as we know today from all the year along in young indexes. Uh, so, but that began the, to demonstrate what the, the regulators and the politicians, where they were going to take the water. They were going to take it to the halls of General Assembly, and the watermen had to become political. There was no other recourse, because everything is politics. And um, an example of it, which I'm going to get to, is the biggest issue right now is oyster sanctuaries. The O'Malley administration uh, really didn't care about the water. Uh, they did it to protect the bay and improve water quality and improve the oyster population. When they multiplied, took away so many thousands of acres from public bottom, which could be harvested, to sanctuaries. They increased it like by 75% the number of sanctuaries. They left the watermen in a state of bewilderment. Now, the Oyster Advisory Commission was set aside to do a five-year study of the oyster industry and the oysters and the sanctuaries. And it was a five-year study. Now it's, no decision's been made, so it's now in the seventh year on what to do about the sanctuaries. Well, there's a bill in the legislature right now to either open them up a little bit more or keep them closed. And who knows what's going to come out of that. There is a proposal to open up a thousand acres of bottom and make it public, meaning that the watermen can go collect oysters off there. But there's, see, there's another little thing in here. They believe that if we don't touch the oysters on the sanctuary, then those oysters will keep growing and filtering and doing what oysters are supposed to do. Except for the fact that they're going to silt in and be buried under mud or bottom. So what we wanted to try to do, and you'll extend this mix here, is to allow the oysters on the sanctuary to be turned over and cultivated every so often. And we would be allowed to harvest some oysters on this. In Virginia, if this is a sanctuary, they open up this part of the sanctuary for watermen to work it on a rotational basis. Then they close that and they make that a sanctuary again. And then they open up this part. And that way the sanctuary gets worked, the oysters get harvested, baby oysters replenish. Blah, 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 blah. That's what we're trying to do here, called rotation. But so far, Maryland's not really looking at that. They might be looking at it now. But that gives everybody a better perspective of how to move forward. And, and if they do open up another 1,000 acres, that will be great. 
Um, but along with this, when they started putting in the sanctuaries and closing it to watermen, they told the watermen, now what we, what we really want you to do now is shift to aquaculture. We want you to raise your oysters. You can raise them in cages. You can raise them on your lease bottom. So go out and lease some bottom from the state, where a lot of you all have in your families passed down, and or start developing it in cages. And the cages hang from the surface. And we have some big aquaculture businesses now. We, uh, Aquaculture means farm-raised. We farm-raised catfish, we farm-raised striped bass, we farm-raised oysters. Overseas, they raise crabs. Well, 90% of the U.S. Is seafood comes is imported. And that's also a tragedy. But uh, you see, they can sell foreign crab meat that was farm-raised for $10 a pint. Well, we sell it by the seafood and shady, uh, church did, lump, pint, pasteurized, Maryland crab meat, packaged in Cambridge for $32 a pint. And I did a story, no, a little tangent. I, literally, I did a story about the fish place, J.J. O'Donnell up in Jessup, that's where we have a lot of big uh, fish places to get seafood from around the world, distribute it in the United States. And when the story was finished, uh, he gave me a pint of lump crab meat, actually gave me two, from Venezuela. And he said, try this. You know, we just got it in. So it wasn't Asian, it was from Venezuela. Brought it home. It was beautiful. There wasn't any Maryland crab taste to it. There was no taste to it. It was farm rates in Venezuela, crabs. So that's another issue that we're fighting, and we're working with the feds on that stuff to big controversy, labeling. You have to tell the consumer where did this product come from? And my niece in Sarasota was so excited, she said, I got crab meat from Glen Burnie. I said, man, you didn't get crab meat from Glen Burnie. Yes, I did. It's on the plastic container. We got it at Sam's Club, and it's packaged in Glen Burnie. I said, it's foreign crab meat packaged in Glen Burnie, Maryland. It is not Chesapeake oh. Bay crab meat. And anyway, she we had an argument, but didn't she boy? But uh, that's what we have to get around. And I see that's a huge issue with the grocery people, the distributors, the all the people that are bigger than the water. Down. And that's why I was called Dave and Goliath. But um, so anyway, that's uh, just fear information. But agriculture is also extremely expensive to get into. And you have to get the cages, you have to, actually you have to get a lot of Hispanic guys to come and work for you. And we have seasonal workers now under the H2B bill, passed in Congress, uh, packing houses, aquaculture, landscapers can all bring in migrant workers uh, during the season, which saved us. But we do have Chesapeake Gold over, uh, over on the Eastern Shore. We have Hollywood Oysters. All these oyster companies you see like that, Hollywood Oysters, Chesapeake Gold, such and such. We got a great one down at Brooms Island. It's a family. Uh, they're all raising oysters on the bottom one leases or in cages. Now another thing that was interesting past last year was the restaurant industry knew that if they were agriculture, theoretically, every oyster you grow could look the same and looks the same. Because it comes from spat, baby oyster, 
You raise them in a cage to this point, and then you put them in here at this point, and it goes down like an assembly line until you get your mature oyster. Well, in Maryland, we have a law that the oyster has to be three inches to be harvested. And you see them, if you get oysters wild, um, you know, they're different sizes and they're irregular and all that stuff. Okay. So, Robert T. Brown, president of the Warmers Association, got with John Chockley over on the Eastern Shore and said, you know what we need to do? You guys can all, all around the state, you guys can produce a two-inch oyster that all has the same cup. Got me? The oyster, the oysters in here. So it has the same cup, but instead of three inches, it's two inches. So they're all identical. Pass the law, okay, during the off-season, in the summer, not during the oyster season, it has to be three inches. But during the off season, oyster aquaculture can sell a two inch oyster. What that did was open up the markets from New York to Washington. High end restaurants. Buy them like there's no tomorrow, sell them for two dollars a piece or whatever. And there's a new market for the watermen to do aquaculture. Great. When we the snakehead came up. Yeah. You know about the snakehead, the fish that walks on water, came out of a pond in Crofton, started walking across to the next creek, then into the rivers. They're all over the Potomac. And they're in they're, they're worried they're gonna get into the Patuxent, but they need everything. And they're ugly as hell. But what did we do? We got a market for snakehead, because it's delicious to eat, the high-end restaurants, and we were getting five dollars a pound. Well, if you tell a waterman he can get five dollars a pound for anything, he'll go catch it. And so, that opened up another market, the snakehead. Then we had one more example. And well, you guys start taking a nap. Um, <laughs> cow nose rays. Like skate. You don't know them? Um, <laughs> what's the. Wait. Oh, the. You know that? Like stingray. Stingray. Like a stingray? Like a stingray, okay. Okay. Skate. Well, there's skate and then there are cow nose rays. And the cow nose rays look scouts. like a cow's nose. <laughs> but they're like skate, they have the wings and so forth. And if you're out on a boat, you can see 20 of them swimming around the boat. If they're around your trot line, which I've experienced a million times, and they come around, well, no crabs will go in the line. So you just pull your stuff in and hang it up for the day. Because they eat the crabs. And they eat oysters and they eat clams. The only natural predator they have is a shark, huh? of which we have some in the bay. And bow hunters. And what? Bow hunters. Wasn't there a big article in the paper about shooting okay. bow and arrow? The peg's going to take over my talk. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. So what they discovered is they can have a tournament for bow hunters to shoot <laughs> skate, or cow nose rays. And they had other people that would hit them over the head with baseball bats when they got them on the boat. And then all the PETA people went crazy because it was inhumane. Um, but there is a market for cow nose rays. And they're selling that in high-end restaurants. Like they sell shark fin soup, which is now outlawed in the United States. Um, so anyway, there's a bill in the legislature now to ban the tournaments. Well, the watermen are for the uh, were, are against the ban because they want to get rid of the rays. They're eating oysters, baby crabs, everything. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, oh, on the sanctuary issue, 
in the Houston Capitol, there's a huge column on the op-ed page, Don't Shrink Bay Oyster Sanctuaries, by Senator Ben Cardin. So he's weighing in now on the sanctuary issue. Now I bet a dollar to a donut that he didn't write this. Somebody from CBF wrote it, or Chesapeake Bay Program, maybe a staff of network one, but anyway, it's his column. Now he supports and has gotten a lot of money for the oyster restoration effort, 60 to 300 million, which is fabulous. Just last year he got it. But you can't work on this hand and then work this hand, which is contradictory. I mean, you got to be all the way or no, because this is about politics. This is letting all of you know that he is against this and he got all this money and he, okay, but he didn't mention the waterman. He didn't say, I want a sustainable fishery. Everything is great and scientists are fabulous. And the guys from the CBF, the Bill Goldsboro just retired, uh, fabulous scientists, fisheries. And while he put in the idea of an oyster moratorium a few years ago, as did a guy at the University of Maryland, which went nowhere, um, nevertheless, he always tried to put science in, sustainable fisheries, and sustainable bay. Keep moving that C minus up. Okay? So, that's, I think, what we all have to do. If you hear some, somebody say this or say that about the bay or the water quality or the oysters, I hear it all the time. Well, what, what, what's happening with the oysters? Well, let's see, they're being over harvested. They're pollution. They're being over harvested. They have OSX and Verma. But they're really, they're being over harvested. No, they're not. The recreational boating industry, that includes the charter captains taking parties out for rock, strike bass, and rock fish. They now realize, and I wrote a piece on National Fishermen about this, they generate nationally $700 billion in fishing gear, boats, all that, which is clearly understandable. I mean, we have a couple hundred thousand boats just in Maryland, with how small we are. But now what they realize is, wait, we can take this money and we can use it to influence Congress and our state legislature. Because it's all about money and it's all about power. Now in Massachusetts and in North Carolina, all of a sudden there's a bill put in those states, Massachusetts, North Carolina. Coastal Conservation Association sounds great. They want all the fish for their members, their recreational fishing. Stripers forever in Massachusetts. Another group that wants striped bass to be a game fish. North Carolina, game fish. Tried that in Maryland, we killed it, and it's never been brought up again. We worked with North Carolina, and we worked with Massachusetts. New Jersey passed it. So their watermen, their fishermen, had to find a new, some new market to make up for that loss that they lost from the straight bass. And this is what they're up against. But now it's been out that they're up against billions of dollars that are going to go into the interests of those fishermen. The recreational fishermen, <clears throat> all that. Because there's nothing that CCA, American Sport Fishing Association, and those groups would like better than to have 
commercial fishing go away. But nobody thinks about that until you end up with people in New Jersey who don't have any straight bass teeth. Or in Florida where you have no red snap, or you have no... CCA passed, got the bill passed in Florida 20 years ago that they can't use any gill nets. Well, what's going to happen to the fisheries then? They're not going to be caught. So, they have terrible problems with the fish in Florida now. But, I'm just trying to tell you how money and politics are going to influence the future of the day. Not only for the watermen, but for you all too. Or your kids, or your grandchildren. Um, and you know, whether there's global warming or not, I have no idea. I won't be around to see it. But, what I do see is attempts by Oyster Recovery Partnership, Bay Foundation, to put more oyster shell back into the bay, which is fabulous. Oyster Recovery Partnership has put billions of baby oysters back in the bay and spat on shell. And this is what we need. So is CBF. But it has to keep working for it to be sustainable. And the oyster industry has to be sustainable if we're going to clean up the water quality of the bay and get more grasses back. And with the grasses come the baby fish and the baby crabs because they used it for protection and habitat and food. And I have no idea what time it is. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, I have, oh, okay. Yeah, five so, more I, minutes. I know, I know, but I want to I answer questions. So, I've always said for 30 years when I give talks, we have, to listen to program, who said we've met the enemy and it's us. And that my favorite book, Joni probably might be remember this, is The Lorax by Dr. Seuss. <laughs> And if you don't think it can happen, read the Lord out. Thank you very much. Now, can you have a Besides that, to the C minus is the best management practices of dairy farmers and the other farmers in Pennsylvania for all the water going into the Susquehanna, which is the fresh water that comes into the bay and brings all, well, it used to, bring in a lot more manure and nutrients. So I, I said 30 years ago, until we get the mechanic in Frostburg to understand that what he does every day with oil that affects the Chesapeake Bay, we're, we're not going to make any progress. I mean, that, that's what we have to do. It's, well, that's from New York to here. So, that's how big it is, and that's, that's what we need. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah, they're good. Yep. And if you, uh, it's interesting, if you go to Old Ebbett Grill in D.C., they generally have about 15 different varieties of oysters, from New York all the way to Maryland. And they charge an arm and a leg, but it's, it's worth it to taste these different oysters. And it's like Chincoteague, Lower Bay, up here, they're all different tastes. 
uh, a guy, an old waterman, told me one time that if you let me taste your crab, I can tell you where it was caught. Yeah. And right now, with Bob Evans, we're selling oysters like there's no tomorrow because we're getting them all from the Lower Potomac and St. Mary's. And they have a, a little bit of a salty taste, and they're real fat. Not like chinky tea, they're real salty, but more salty than up here. So, you know, it's interesting. But we have uh, people that come in just to get those oysters. And, and it's, I mean, it's interesting because in another month, nobody will want oysters, so they'll want crabs. And then in September, October, they won't want crabs, they'll want oysters. So, it's a cycle for everybody. Okay, well, oh, go ahead. The sanctuaries, I think, are a great program because um, in the 80s, there were millions of, um, millions of oysters being carved in the day and shipped across the country and the world. Yeah. The whole thing is developed right. like that. Then they were completely over on the street. Yep. I mean, they left the free market, put them in the world over the bottom of the and they did. They wiped out the oyster industry themselves. Um, that means that people shoot can at each other to keep the game around, trying to protect the oyster thing. But it's Absolutely. my oyster, not your oyster. Yep. That, and that, in the world where they destroyed the oyster habitat just the day, added in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, a lot of pollution being done in the day, really active. And so they had to do sanctuary, they had to move to agriculture mm -hmm. because. The industry was bombed out. It was, you know, compared to the way it was when John Smith came up to his area in 1608, the day was a uh, whole different world. And it, was a, it wasn't all the fault of the ocean, obviously, but it was part of the fault that that happened. So now we get to the point in 2017 when we still have people who know the ocean because they work with them. And so, from one perspective, I think you're right. So did the ocean men and the crabbers that understand what's really going on today because they understand that they are on the sea. How many of us in this room have ever gone out and crab oysters? Right. So they're a great resource. They're a good um, barometer for what's going on. But at the same time, they have their own separate. So it's that balancing act. And Senator Sarbanes fished the $300 million to retire his oyster beds. Mm -hmm. He also said at the same time that why are we spending all this money, taxpayer dollars, to replenish those resources that have been allowing to get 200 people at Tommy Harvest? We're subsidizing the ocean and whether they're getting them off the open bars or not. They put all this money in the creating bars. Well, so the balancing act there, right. between trying to restore the oyster stock and um, deal with the pesticide uh, parasites and get a healthy oyster and then let that naturally Wow, okay, um, if we have, okay. so it's complicated. If we have 500 working oyster, which is probably an exaggeration, there, unlike the 1880s or 1930s, they have huge restrictions, huge regulations. They can take 15 bushels of boat. Okay, a 15 bushel of boat is not going to decimate the oyster population. The other thing that I didn't mention was that if you go off Holland Point down here, we know that there's oysters that big there in three feet a month. That's a closed area. We can't turn it over. We can't dig them out and re and cultivate those oysters and cultivate that body. They did let us do it in Tangier Sound where they were not getting any bushels of oysters. And when they let the power drivers go in there and turn up Tangier Sound, the next year, every boat got its quota of 15 bushels there because they let them turn it over. That's what people don't understand. I got calls from people in Fairhaven when I lived up the hill there. There's a guy out in front of Fairhaven and he's turning up all the mud. I don't know what he's doing, but he's destroying everything. Well, actually, no, he's not. He's clamming, for one thing, and he's taking this much mud and taking the clams and putting them up a conveyor. But what he's doing is turning everything out of it. He's cultivating the soil. So you have to try to educate yourself 
I, I understand your points completely, completely, but as an old waterman who's now can't work anymore, he's in my book, said you have to be a lawyer now to be a waterman. That the, law, the rules are this thick. And you got to remember, too, that we get busted, watermen get busted, for crossing imaginary lines in the sanctuaries. They just arrested two last week. Um, and, it, I mean, they have to make a living. They don't know anything else. But they put so many regulations on them that it's very difficult to make a living. Larry Sims was a clamor, and he told me 30 years ago when I was working on my first book, we're allowed to catch 10 bushels, but we take 11. The 11th bushel goes under the cabin under blankets. Because we can't make a living on 10 bushels. It's the 11th bushel that helps pay for food and the boat and all that. So, believe me, that's, that's how they think. They, they have to come away. I know it's illegal. They know it's illegal too. But if the state won't bend, by well, listen, they don't have any other choice. And believe me, the police are over them like sheets. Mm -hmm. I heard that the snake heads like reproduce like crazy in fish. And that uh, um, even with fishing snake heads and even with that you know, demand yeah. that it's going to be pretty much impossible to keep them from devastating the conditions that we face as we know it. Is that really? Well, that could happen because what we're worried now is they're going to somehow work their way up to the toxic. Mm -hmm. Then they'll take over the toxic. Mm -hmm. But we have the same problem with the big blue catfish. They're not, they're an invasive species, like snakehead and they didn't get up to 100 pounds. They eat everything in the world. It's a terrible, terrible problem in Virginia, on the James and the Rappahannock. And uh, when you have fish that big, uh, there's no quota. I mean, they want you to kill as many of them as you can. In fact, they gave you a reward for killing. The snakeheads. Um, but, you know, these things get introduced one way or another, and I don't know how, but uh, in five minutes over, Grace is going to yank me off the stage. But I'll tell you one other story, too. You know hydrilla? The grass that grows like there's no tomorrow? And it can clog up a creek or a river just like that. So years ago, we found out well, people would try to yank it out with forks uh, and rakes, but all it did was populate even more. So now they have machines that can harvest it without letting it spread. But we also found out that, you know, it feeds off the hydrilla, the northern pike, the fish. So we introduced pike to the upper Potomac to keep a lid on the hydrilla while it would be harvested. Um, so these are all things that, I mean, they just happen in your bay and rivers. And you, I mean, you, you, you just don't know, but the, the marine scientists and the watermen know what's going on. They can just work together to, instead of fighting, most for a big part, they do work together. But, you know, when somebody throws out moratorium, where they throw out game fish, where they throw out increase the size of the crab. That's all that does is make a fight. So there you are. Too late. <laughs> no, I was going to say, with all your expertise and um, No expertise. Yes. Um, you're also a poet. Yes. I would love to hear you read one of your poems you just passed for Yes. <laughs> okay, well, I'll tell you, I get paid overtime for all this. My knees are locking up. <laughs> now, Forty years ago. Okay, so I wrote Just Passing Through. 
during a frustrating period when uh, I, I, people just weren't, weren't paying attention, they weren't aware of what the hell is going on around here. And I wrote Sun Up to Sundown and Dancing with the Tide. But this was a book of Marion Warren photographs. You know him? Yes. And I went through about 600 of his photographs and picked out the poems I wanted, and then I wrote a poem about it. Now, Mary Warren worked with his wife, Mary, for 60 years. And he's known all over the world, and everybody loved Mary. But Mary kept a lid on him. And Mary was getting a little dementia at the time. I went over to his townhouse in Annapolis, and he and I were great friends. We had done book signings together everywhere. He was just a remarkable man. So I told him about my idea. Well, pick out 10 pictures and then write a poem for each one. Because he had never even thought of this concept. And he did books too. So anyway, I go back a week later, he said, I love you. This is fabulous. But Mary doesn't get it. <laughs> oh my God. And despite Mary's condition, he always honored Mary because they went back to when they were like 15 or something. So he said, well, let's, let's just do it. And when we got it done, Mary came around. But Marion just passed away five or more years probably, at 84, I think, or 87. So anyway, this is a book of Marion's, let me try to find something here. Okay, this relates to what we talked about today. The problem is stupid, I don't number of my pages. Um, okay, this is a crab shanty over on Smith Island. Look at the picture. Can you see it? You might want to move up. Can you see it? Now there's a marsh behind there, like a little channel. And, okay. Okay. Now get that one. So back behind these shanties is a little channel where the boats would come in, okay? Uh, the, you know, the crab boats with the crabs. So I said, uh, we walked many a crooked path, you and me. Never could get things straight, could we? And even now, when we thought they'd never find us, our hideaway at the end of another crooked path, we hear the sound of the bulldozers still. Okay. I'm going to put them. I don't want to. Stephen Wall, the one under by the book. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> These are guys unloading fish, probably 40, 50 years ago. It's like they unloaded them in big scoops from a pound net. Mm -hmm. Back in the day. Back in the day. Uh, hold on, I have a look. Somehow we put our lives together, piece by piece, bit by bit, and we had to tweak it now and again, just to get it right. Somehow we put our lives together, with a little bit of this, and a little bit of that, 
He had to bend the rules to get it just right. Somehow we put our lives together and I'm glad we figured it out. These are not all about watermen. They're just people. That's all they are. There's our people. Um, okay, this is an old black lady in a real rural town walking her granddaughter down the street. Lies beyond the bend in the road, I don't know. What waits for you round there, I don't know. What stands here is all I know. But we can walk this far with you. Anyway, let's just keep going. They're just about. show you this picture, I'm not going to use it more. But I had to use this picture. I had to. My book, you think I know where the hell things were. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll do this one for you. Okay, just look at this picture. For those of you who can't see it, it's a old rural church maybe 50, 60 years ago. And the sign on the derelict building is the house of God, the church of the living God, the gates of heaven. And that's what's written on the building. And there's a little kid sitting on the porch. And I had to use a picture. I didn't know what the hell I was going to write about. <laughs> You're the Rod McEwen of Waterman, aren't you? Yeah, a fair <laughs> So, okay, so here's a picture. Now, this is typical. This is in every country store, from one end of the day to the other, playing cards. And I'll tell you something. had to do, this guy here, this guy here in the end, we had to crop the picture because he was showing a plumber's crack. <laughs> <laughs> I told Marion, I don't think that's going to fly. <laughs> anyway, so I said, Sunday we gather together as we always have. Brothers in communion, offering confession, cleansing our spirits by swapping lies, telling tales, and bluffing our way through another Sunday. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming today. Yep, thank you. Thank you.